Christopher Columbus by Benny Rhodes. Chapter 11. Bound in Chains. We sailed from Seaville on May 30, 1498, with eight ships and 300 settlers. It was good to be at sea again. The two long years of waiting for a third voyage to begin had made me restless and eager to be going. We stopped at the island of Madeira, where I visited with some of my some members of the family of my beloved Philippa. Then catching the trade winds, we slipped away to the Canaries, where we made our usual stop for more food and supplies. At the Canary Islands, we divided the fleet. I took three ships with me to sail south by west and sent the others on the direct route to Hispaniola. I was anxious to continue my exploration. This time, I wanted to find the continent. I had been looking for on my other voyages. After 17 days of sailing, one of our men on lookout shouted, Land! In the distance, we could see an island with three distinct mountain peaks rising majestically up from the sea. I named the island Trinidad after the Holy Spirit. Since we needed fresh water, we decided to anchor near Trinidad and barter some with the natives. The natives of Trinidad had lighter skin than the others we had seen in the Indies. They were graceful and handsome to look upon. Their long hair was worn straight like the Spaniards of Castile. They wore scarves of cotton on their heads. Our first meeting with them was not very pleasant. A canoe with about 24 men in it came ro rowing out to our ship. The men were armed with bows and arrows. They carried shields to protect them from attack. When the boat would not come close to our ship, I asked one of the men to play his tambourine on the deck while other men danced. I hoped the festivities might interest the natives enough that they would come out to the ship. The plan backfired on us. Eventually, the Indians thought we were doing a war dance. They showered us with arrows which we were, which were swiftly projected from the bows in their boat. I ordered the ship's guns to fire over them. This frightened the natives, and they fled away without any real harm being done. Some of the men aboard ship had picked up their first souvenirs, Indian war arrows. Sailing around to the southwestern end of Trinidad, we anchored in a narrow neck of water, which I called the Serpent's Mouth. The current here was very swift. The land that lay to the west of us was not a part of the island. There were giant waves in the serpent's mouth, and I noticed that large amounts of fresh water were being pumped into the stream. Exploring further, we found the mouth of a large river, which surely could come only from great distances. The natives called their, their land Peria, Venezuela. They had named the river the Orinoco, what do, you, what do you make of it, Admiral, the pilot of the ship asked me. I believe we have discovered the mainland, I said. The large amount of fresh water in the sea means the river must be a very long one, stretching far into the continent itself. The natives of Pera, Peria, Peria told us of the pearl fisheries nearby. They said the ocean bed was literally covered with pearls. It was here, near the river bed of the Orinoco, that Europeans first stepped ashore on the new continent, South, South America. I was sure this was part of the mainland. But the mainland of what? It was not China nor India. It was eventually some new land which no one had dreamed even existed. I did not know at this time how extensive a discovery we had made. Later I was to learn that we were on a part of a vast new con continent unknown to the civilized world before. At that moment, we all knew we had a great discovery, but we were not sure what it was. I was thankful to God for his blessings, and I claimed the land for Spain. Shortly after our discoveries near Trinidad, we sailed for San Domingo. I was anxious to see how the settlement was coming, and to send the news of our new discoveries to Spain. 
It was good to see Bartholomew and Diego again, but I noticed that the settlement was only half completed. After two and a half years, very little progress had been made. The trouble had begun shortly after I sailed home to Spain. Bartholomew told me about it. Francisco Roldan, the man you appointed as chief justice before you left, rebelled against us. He took about 70 men from the settlement and went off to live in the southwestern corner of Hispaniola. He actually set up a rival kingdom there. We have had nothing but trouble. Besides that, complained Diego, we are out of food. But what about the supply ships I sent, I sent to you? I asked. Unfortunately, said Bartholomew, it landed on the side of the island that is controlled by Roldan. He got most of the supplies. Two of the ships finally came over here, and I have managed to get most of the men from Roldan's grasp. But most of the supplies were lost. What about Hoyeda? I asked. I remembered the trouble he had been before. Hoyeda has returned to Spain, Diego reported. It was a good riddance, too. Later, Bartholomew confessed to me. Perhaps I have been too harsh with the men. Now that you are here, maybe you can help us straighten out the revolt. I began by writing a letter to Roldan. I offered amnesty to all the men who had rebelled and guaranteed them a safe return to Spain if they would lay down their arms and stop fighting. My aim was to restore peace to the island so we could get on with the business of building a settlement. After long months of negotiations, we finally ended the revolt, and I restored Roldan to his office as Chief Justice. Many of the men who had rebelled with him returned to Spain safely, as I had promised. When peace was restored, I felt it was time to build the settlement in earnest. I personally supervised some of the building projects and helped the men with their problems. Soon things began to happen. Buildings were completed, crops were sown in the fertile soil, and a spirit of cooperation filled the air. The people became excited about the possibilities that existed in the new world. Many people were allowed to farm individual plots of land and to claim that land for themselves. Just when things were beginning to blossom again in San Domingo, more trouble developed. First, there was another small rebellion. I sent Bartholomew into the jungles with a small army to put down the rebellion. I went off to Viga Real, the area of the gold mine, to see how things were pro progressing there. I left Diego in San Domingo to keep the work going. On August 23, 1499, a small fleet of ships sailed into the harbor at San Domingo. In that fleet was a man named Francisco de Bobadilla, who immediately took over the affairs of the island. He introduced himself as the new governor sent by the king and queen to replace me and to straighten out the affairs of the colony. The word was sent to me by messenger that I should return to San Domingo with haste. It took three days travel through the jungles to get there. When I arrived, I found that Bo Badilla had placed Diego in jail and had taken over my private quarters. He had confiscated everything that belonged to me. When I confronted him, he explained his powers to me. The king and queen have appointed me as governor of Hispaniola, he said. They have given me absolute authority to return to Spain anyone whom I deem necessary in order to restore peace to the island. Bobadilla stopped long enough to flail at a mosquito buzzing around his head. Then he continued, Therefore, Don Columbus, I am arresting you and your brothers by order of the king and queen and returning you to Spain to report your actions to the crown. With that, Bobadilla ordered that I be placed in chains. None of the men would do the distasteful job of placing the chains upon me. Finally, Espinosa, my cook, stepped forward and volunteered to do it. He riveted the chains on my arms and legs, and I was carried away to a jail cell. I received word that my brother Bartholomew 
had heard about my arrest and was preparing to march with his men against Bobadilla. Good old Bart, he was willing to risk his life to free me. I persuaded him by messenger not to do this. I asked him instead to surrender to Bobadilla. I felt that Bobadilla had overstepped his authority and that justice would be done when we returned to Spain. In a few days, Bartholomew returned to San Domingo and quietly surrendered to Bobadilla. He was placed in chains and locked up in jail with Diego and me. The humiliation of my arrest overwhelmed me. I could not believe what was happening. Here I was, Christopher Columbus, Admiral of the Ocean Sea, who had discovered and given to the king and queen vast ter territories which would make them the richest monarchs in history. And I was to be bound in chains and sent home like a, co like a common criminal. Was this gratitude? Who could justify such action against one who had done so much for them? I prayed in my prison cell that God would forgive, forgive them for their acts of cruelty and humiliation to me and my brothers. Finally, we were placed on two ships for the return to Spain. Diego and I were on one ship, and Bartholomew on the other. As soon as the ships were out of the harbor, Andres Martin, the captain, and Alonso de Vallejo, the guard, came to me. Admiral said, Vallejo, we wish to strike the chains from you. Why, I asked. Because we do not believe the king and queen authorized Bo Badilla to put you in chains. Andres said, Everyone knows that the accusations against you are false, Vallejo added. But I refuse to permit them to remove the chains. I will wait, I said, and see what the king and queen say about this. Diego was freed from his chains, however, and allowed to wait upon me. He was a great comfort and solace to me in this, the darkest hour of my life. I cannot believe the king and queen did this, he said to me one day. It was the evil mind of Bo Bedilla who thought this up. I hope you are right, Diego, I said. I had always believed that the king and queen, especially the queen, had great confidence in me. But now I am beginning to wonder. We spent the days on the long voyage home praying for God's guidance and deliverance. Even then... I was thinking of another trip to the Indies. I needed to find those pearls for the for the king and queen. I was sure there were still other lands as yet undiscovered and unchartered, which I could find, and I still dreamed of opening up vast new areas for the gospel of Christ, so that millions of people who had never heard of him might be converted. I might be in chains for the moment, but I still felt God's hand upon me. I knew my work was not done. We arrived at Cadez in October. There were crowds of people in Cadez to meet us. The word had gone out that the, out that the men who had opened up a whole new world for Spain was coming home in chains. The crowds lined the roads from Cadez to Seville to see the Spanish to see the spectacle of the great hero being led across, being led along by guards with chains on his feet and hands. The popular reaction to this sight was overwhelming. The crowds protected the action of the monarchs. Everywhere there were shouts, Free him! Free him! Many of my friends wrote letters to, of protest to the officials. Why, they asked. Why is the noble Don Columbus in chains? Why he has opened up a whole new world for Spain? In this any way, is this any way to show our gratitude? Fur furious and angry protests swept through the land. It was encouraging to know that people were upset at our treatment. They demanded immediate action from the king and king and queen. Meanwhile, I was lodged in the monastery at Seville, waiting for orders from the king and queen. It was almost a month before those orders came. They ordered my immediate release 
from the chains and asked me to report to them at Granada. On December 17, at the, at the Alhambra in Granada, I fell on my knees before King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. I asked them to forgive me for any wrong which I might have done. They immediately pardoned me and my brothers and apologized for the treatment we had received. The queen burst into tears when she saw the look of gratitude on my face. It was never our intention, she said, for you to be placed in chains, even or even ar arrested. That's right, Don Columbus, the king added. Senor Bobadilla clearly overstepped his authority by such actions. For for that, we will demand an accounting from him. Later, the king told me, we do feel, Don Columbus, that it is necessary to turn the affairs of the colony over to someone else. We believe that you are valuable as an explorer, not as an, not as an administrator. At least they were expecting me to sail again. That was good news. And I rejoiced in my heart that God still wanted to use me. Our family celebrated Christmas holidays together in Seville for the first time in years. With me were my brothers, Bartholomew and Diego, my two sons, Diego and Ferdinand, and Beatrice. In spite of our recent ordeal, the atmosphere was light and gay. All of Spain is talking about your discoveries, Chris, Beatrice said. Yes, Father joined in Diego. They are saying that you have discovered a vast continent that will make Spain the richest and most powerful nation on earth. I hear that other discoveries are being made too. Yes, Bartholomew joined the conversation. I heard that an Italian by the name of Amerigo Vespucci has been in the areas you have already chartered around Trinidad. Will you go to the New World again, Father? asked Ferdinand. I certainly will, I said. The king has already authorized another fleet for me. May I go with you this time, Father? asked Ferdinand. I want to write an account of your travels and discoveries. I looked at my youngest son. He was only 12 years old and still, ha and still just a lad. My mind went back to that day when I was 10 years old. I remembered how I had longed to sail the seas even then. Why not? I said to Ferdinand. The sea had been good to me. Perhaps it will be good for you too.